Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, my name is François Leon Pichet. I'm one of the two assistant curators working on the Constitutional Court Art Collection. My colleague, Tina Mia, is also, I'm, I'm logging in from the offices of the Constitutional Court. She's also here along with our curatorial intern, Kaylee Fisher, and artists, Vincent Beloy and Tukaya, Charles and Corsi. They're also here in the office, but they're on another computer that unfortunately doesn't have a camera. So we're all watching and we're here and we'll all be coming to the screen when it's our turn to speak and you'll be seeing Tina and Kaylee later on in our tour. I just wanted to note that this, uh, the webinar is being recorded, so please be aware of that. Um, again, welcome to all our esteemed guests, uh, speakers, colleagues, artists and supporters of our work, both of the Constitutional Court Trust and the Arts and Ubuntu Trust. Um, we, we do have load shedding in South Africa. Currently at the court, we've got load shedding and we're on generator power and Bridget will be speaking. She's also logging in from her phone. So we are aware that some people might be struggling to, to join the call and we're, we are aware of that. So um, yeah, um, my role today is primarily to be the keeper of time and to fulfill my role, I've um, on the recommendation of my colleagues, I've gathered a very red piece of paper, which are, had has a big one minute on so i'll try and just uh nudge you if if you go over time to to make sure we, we stick to the schedule um but we are looking forward to to be hearing from everybody um unfortunately catherine kennedy due to family reasons cannot be joining us today uh, but she does send her regards to everybody here catherine kennedy is the manager of the constitutional court trust um and before we go ahead, I just wanted to say a few words. Recently, uh, Justice Cici Campepe, who's the outgoing chairperson of the um, Constitutional Court Trust and the Constitutional Court Art Collection Artworks Committee, wrote a very beautiful letter where she spoke about the works that we'll be looking at today. Um, she, she addressed the, the interplay of mediums between these four distinct yet interrelated works. Manchoba's original painting and Lovu's textile, Randall's sculpture and Abdul Qadir Ahmed Sahid's film, and that they offer bountiful interpretive possibilities. The interconnectedness of South Africa with the African continent and how the CCAC doesn't just look inwards but considers constitutionalism more broadly was noted in her letter. The significant context of Manchoba's time spent in exile and the sense of community across the world around what our constitution comes to represent today was also recognized. And I quote, Manchoba's message saying we need to preserve African heritage as a shared heritage of humanity resonates with Joseph and Lovu's humanity, the very first artwork of the CCAC or the Constitutional Court Art Collection, aptly speaking to our constitutional ideals as reflected in the CCAC. We are still in the process of requesting the loan of the um, original Manchoba painting, The Ancestor, from Johannesburg Art Gallery. It's contained in their, in their collection. And uh, we hope that we'll be able to have it installed soon in the Constitutional Court along all the, the other work that we'll, look, that we'll be looking at today, which is Joseph and Lorbu's Inspired by the Ancestor, the handwoven tapestry, Dorothy Randall's bust of the young, young Ernest Manchoba, Abdul Qadir Ahmed Sahid's film, re, um, reading the ancestor, and then everything is inspired by and, and comes from the original Manchoba painting. So I, I would like to introduce Bridget Thompson. We've been working quite closely together for the past couple of weeks, uh, but the idea of this webinar were a celebratory event um, to, to look at these works has come quite a long way. I think it was about two years ago that Bridget sent us, um, and at the time we were still fairly a new team working on the CCAC, she sent us an email asking whether we would be willing to enter into such a, into such a partnership. And even before that, uh, with previous curators, I see Stacy just joined, um, there were others that, that dealt with Bridget um, before our time at the court in 2018. So it, it's been a long time coming and I'm, I'm very happy that we're finally having our celebratory moment today. Um, I've also had the privilege to see the lovely publication that the Art and Ubuntu Trust is working on, and I'm sure Bridget will be able to will say a few words about this, um, featuring contributions by a number of the speakers we have today. Um, 
in addition to, to previous publications that the Art and Ubuntu Trust have also issued, um, there's the, the, the lovely In the Name of All Humanity, the African Spiritual Expression of Ernest Manchoba catalog that was published around 2006, but Bridget will be able to help me with, with that date. So just handing over to Bridget, I'll be reading short bios of everybody uh, who will be speaking today. Um, Bridget Thompson is a filmmaker and educationist who co-founded and currently manages the Arts and Ubuntu Trust. She directed the 1995 film, Ernest Manchoba at Home, and curated the 2006-2007 commemorative exhibition in the name of all humanity, the African spiritual expression of Ernest Manchoba that was held at the Gold of African Museum in Cape Town. Bridget, over to you. Your muted. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting used to doing this on the phone. Our electricity has just this minute come back, but I'm going to continue on the phone because it will take too much time to go and sign in. Thank you, Francois, and thank you and um, the whole team at the Constitutional Court Art Collection. It has been wonderful working with you and finally bringing this, this day together. I'd like to profoundly thank the Constitutional Court Trust for their welcoming response over the years to the Art and Ubuntu Trust's offerings to the Constitutional Court Art Collection and for hosting today. And may I say all protocol observed and extend warm greetings to all who are present. It's really a touching moment to be joined by friends and family of the artist whose work we celebrate today, as well as the many, many supporters and contributors who made this all possible. We honor and thank each one, whether they're with us today at the webinar or not. If I were to mention all the contributors, I wouldn't have time to say anything else, but please know that you are highly appreciated. I would, however, like to mention those who are non, no longer with us on this earth. The artists Ernest Mangloba, Dorothy Randall, Joseph and Lovu, and the highly esteemed associates of the Art and Ubuntu Trust who contributed to the process. Wonga Mangloba, Ernest's son, also an artist. Dingan Thomas Kappa, who filmed and photographed Raja at work and Ezekiel Budeli, an artist recently taken by COVID, who provided Brajo with moral support and whose work, Ancestral Kingdoms, is also in the um, Constitutional Court Art Trust collection. Um, the production of the art we are celebrating today started 90 years ago, in 1930, in Makanda, when a young, young sculpture student at the university currently known as Rhodes, who was later its very first fine art graduate, notably a woman, Dor focused life as an artist, traversing six decades of exile from 1938, including a number of years in a Nazi internment camp outside Paris. When Ernest Mangloba returned to South Africa after 56 years in 1994 for the retrospective exhibition of his and his wife Sonia's work Hand in Hand, which was curated by Dr. Elsa Miles and it was at, held at the Joe Bogart Gallery, his presence galvanized a deeper awareness of African art and of the values and knowledge systems of our country and continent amongst those he met. Although these values had by no means died, they had not yet had a chance to recover from the ravages our society had experienced, so the light he shone on them at that time was especially meaningful. Since then he has been honoured and his work has been exhibited and taught in a number of situations in South Africa, opening up many more valuable instances. The Art and Ubuntu Trust was initiated in 2006 in order to commemorate Mangalba's passing in 2002 and his 100th anniversary in 2004. And it was commemorated, it was initiated with another expression which Francois has mentioned in the name of all humanity, the African spiritual expression of Ernest Mangalba. And I'd like to just briefly explain how the title of this expression came to be because that theme is picked up in today's event. Um, he said in response to a question, which was whether his paintings were paintings of mourning for his people, he said, my people are the people of the whole world. And he said that very firmly, and that's where in the name of all humanity comes from. The other part of the title came from considering this, together with what he meant when he said that whilst he was painting, he allowed what was, what was in his subconscious to rise up. 
trying to understand what, what might have been in his subconscious, led to a reading of how he represented the proverb, Muntu and Gamuntu and Gabani Abantu in his work, and an understanding that this work was thereby rooted in African spirituality, a truly universal value. Unlike the way we are usually taught to understand universalism in culture as arising from a hierarchy of cultures in which a dominant suppressing culture determines what is universal. In Africa, the cradle of humanity, a universal culture based on values which express a democratic ethos is put forward for all humanity. Ernest Mangnoba's artistic vision expressed this, and I believe led him to make um, led to him making a world historic breakthrough in form and content, which reveals this inner spirit and meaning in his paintings. It was for this exhibition, and in order to express a reading of Manuel's work that the video art you will see later, Reading the Ancestor, was made. And it was through gathering work that re represented Manuel's life for this exhibition that we came to meet Dorothy Randall, who had kept the plaster of Paris bust made in 1930 with her for her lifetime. She gave it to the trust when she was 96, on condition it was placed in a public collection. With the support of the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, the trust had an edition cast in bronze by sculptor and foundryman Eddie de Kock, and was able to donate it to the court's art collection. This process took some time, and the bronze bust was finally delivered in 2016. It seems significant that this modest bust, sculpted in 1930, of a then unlikely candidate for memorialization in bronze, was placed in a public space just after the one of Rhodes had come down at the University of Cape Town. Rolling back from 2016, a few years to 2009, when the Art and Ubuntu Trust Association with Joseph and Glovo started on Sokaya Charles and Corsi's recommendation. We then began exploring the idea of making a tapestry of one of Mangalba's paintings. Justice Sachs was approached, was warmly responsive, and the Constitutional Court Trust welcomed the idea. However, the process took many years to unfold for a number of reasons, amongst them difficulties in finding funding support, which was eventually granted by the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture and gratefully received. But we also had a challenge once we'd found the support because the painting which Brajur had chosen to interpret, Composition 1940, a highly significant work in Mangnoba's oeuvre, was not accessible to us. It is owned by a private collector in Europe who wouldn't even supply a photograph. But thanks to Elsa Miles, the Joburg Art Gallery has a number of Mangnoba's works, and it was here that Brajur chose the ancestor, Le Ancet, 1969 to 71. These difficulties underscore the significance of today and the placing of these interpretations of the ancestor painting in this public space. But difficulties in the process of making any of these works were always solved in a way which made you think, aha, this was meant to be, the delay was for a reason. This recognition allowed me to appreciate the slow, steady, careful process which Ernest Mangalba employed while doing his work. The dating of the ancestor painting from 69 to 71 suggests this, and recently his friend, Alain Spielman, who we'll all meet today, confirmed that Ernest would also isolate whilst working. Coming back to the tapestry, we obtained wool from and were given invaluable technical support in producing a cartoon by Margaret Stevens Tapestry Studio, and Brajo began his isolated year weaving at home in late 2015. Marguerite Stevens said that if anybody could undertake the almost impossible challenge of interpreting this painting in a tapestry, it was Joe. She regarded him as the greatest weaver in South Africa. In the process of weaving, he drew from deep wells of knowledge of his people's symbolic use of color and weaving skills. And the tapestry was delivered to the court in early 2017. Before he passed, Brad Joe saw it on display at the court and engaged a conversation about the process with another artist on Sangoma, David Poshoko. Finally, after these long and deep processes, we are here today, ready to, to honor the process, the products and the artists. I'd like to speak about how working with Ernest Mangnoba's legacy over this period of time has taken me to a place of deeper thinking and feeling to an awareness of truths that exist beneath the surface of our lives. It was my privilege to observe the two artists who responded to Mangalwa's call in the ancestor painting. And time and again, I've seen the healing power of the truths Mangalwa addressed surfacing into consciousness. And I've come to realize what he meant when he said, storytelling keeps society together and we must hang on to the heritage of poetry. I think he was referring to symbolic language, that which makes us human. 
The Blombos Caves in southwestern Cape have revealed the earliest evidence of symbols created by beings from 70,000 years ago, indicating that these were the first human beings. Realizing that the earliest evidence of the conceptual thought that makes us human and distinguishes us from other species is symbols, makes it, it makes it possible to see why the arts and their symbolic languages are so vital for human development and progress. And we can thereby understand why Mang Mulba said, art is not something to tickle or entertain. No, it is serious. It is a matter of life and death. So we are celebrating here today, one of the essentials for human life on earth, art, a code, a symbolic language. In the context of the highest court in the land, which upholds the law, the code of values that govern our society, which allows us to manage the most serious of matters, our human relationships. This is what art and law have in common. Each code the values of our society, one as a guide to action, the other as a guide to an expression of consciousness. It is unique and groundbreaking that a court takes art so seriously. As is often noted, our constitution, the code that guides our behavior, arose out of a sacrifice of many. On one of his return trips to South Africa in the 90s, Ernest Mangalba highlighted one of those generations that received and handed on the baton of the centuries long struggle that led to this constitution. Speaking in 1996 in Johannesburg, he described his peer group from the 1930s in South Africa as that magnificent generation. And here I'm quoting directly from him, whose task it was to lay the foundation for the struggle that was to lead to the building of this nation. And he carried on to say it was his privilege to see this nation's birth and early growth. It comes as no surprise to discover that when he's, one of his peers from that time, the 1930s, playwright Nimrod Ndebele, described him as the leading, as possibly the leading intellectual of his generation, and that he was so warmly remembered by his age group from the 1930s in South Africa when he returned in 1994 and re-met some of them, Governor Becky, Jane Gould Tabata, Nimrod Ndebele. He was able to attend his friend Thomas Masakela's funeral, and he also met Eddie Rue's great niece and others. So here we are back with the 1930s, with the generation, um, where the processes of today started. And we find Ernest Mangnorba in the 1930s with the nickname Stereo for his fiery oratory and denouncing any conformist stereotypical and lazy thinking and leading his peers in his vision of what is to be done. Whilst he deeply respected the efforts and sacrifices made to bring South Africa out of the maelstrom of its violent creation, he already in the 1930s foresaw the Scylla and Charybdis to be navigated in the process and made it clear that the pursuit of artistic expression is not only noble, but essential for the development of a higher consciousness in society. He said, and I quote, some of my political friends told me that the artistic activity was not the most urgent thing to concentrate upon while our people were undergoing such a terrible plight. But I believed that art was precisely also a means to produce a higher consciousness in man, without which any practical achievement would probably sooner or later deviate and miss its point. Therefore, making art, I thought, was as urgent as working for the political evolution. And Francois, I'm nearly finished. Reading, interpreting, and reflecting on the work we celebrate today, and the work of many other South African artists, writers, and musicians, provides us with the possibility of reaching this con consciousness. The Constitutional Court Trust, in nurturing the Constitu Constitutional Court Art Collection, at this highly esteemed apex court of our land provides an opportunity which is truly humbling for the four works, the bust, the oil painting, which inspired the other two, the video art and the tapestry to meet in dialogue with each other and with the public and continue to the work continuing and, and contribute to the work continuing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bridget. If we were in a room, we would hear the applause, but I see Zubaida Jaffa is, is applauding. Um, I want to hand over to Zipo Zinkosi Tayile. Um, Zipo has been an active member of the South African arts community for over a decade. In that time, she has been involved with some of the most innovative sites of creativity, including the artist collective Google, Google Active. She has engaged in various aspects of the art industry, including her own creative work, curatorship, and art administration. The Dayile is an active member of Breaking Bread, a Cape Town-based multidisciplinary space using food as a catalyst to engage with contemporary cultural practices. 
uh, Zippo will be um, leading the next section. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. And good morning to you. Um, greetings, first and foremost, to all the elders in the room, the Mangobas, the, the Randall, and then Lovu uh, family and friends, fellow artists, and everyone in attendance here today. Uh, good morning. I'd like to give thanks to the Constitutional Court Trust and the Art and Ubuntu Trust for inviting me to be part of the celebrations. Um, I'll give you a little brief introduction of uh, the video that we're about to see. The video art piece we're about to view, Reading the Ancestor by Abdul Qadir Ahmed Saheed, was commissioned for the exhibition curated by Bridget Thompson, who you've just heard from a few seconds ago, titled In the Name of All Humanity, the African Spiritual Expression of Enes Mangoba, which opened on June 27 and ran through the summer of 2006 at the Gold of Africa Museum in Cape Town. The video art was intended to be an educational piece which would offer guidance to exhibition goers, not only in how to read this classic painting, Lancetra, created almost three decades prior from 1969 to 1971, but also provide an understanding of Mangoba's methodology rooted in his philosophy of looking back to the past to find a way to the future, thereby facilitating a dialogue between the artists uh, of the interpreted work, Ernest Mangoba, and the audience while creating a new appreciation of his aesthetic. When the artist uh, Ahmed Saeed was in the process of creating this video uh, work in 2006, his home country was undergoing a civil war. This new painful reality pushed the artist to dig deeper and reflect on his own experiences with the help of Mangoba's wisdom. He identified with a statement by Mangoba on what humanity faces if it cannot live in peace. So to begin today's celebration, we would like to uh, take a few minutes to screen a reading the ancestor. The video was donated to the CCAC earlier this year by Thomas Films. And in a letter of acceptance, Justice Tisi Kambebe on uh, behalf of the Constitutional Court Trust stated that the work added new layers of interpretation to the oil painting that this artistic interpretation within a broader African context was valued. And it is with these uh, reasons that uh, the host chose to include this work in today's discussion to enrich the interpretation of these works. Um, just to give you a little bit of a short biography on who Abdul Qadir uh, Ahmed Sahid is, he's a filmmaker who was born in 1953 in Mogadishu. He's made many films and contributed significantly to film programs, including those uh, of Art and Ubuntu Trust which he co-founded and meticulously photographed its work for 16 years and counting. Abdul Qadir met all the artists we're celebrating here today. Enes Mangoba affectionately called him Madoda, Dorothy Randall, who he photographed, and Joseph Mdlovu, about whom he made a short film. So I would just request Malik and Tony Ejave to play the video art. And thereafter, we will come to hear from our guest speakers, Imru, Pakari and Tineni Pro Sobopa. All right. Uh, thanks, Malik. Um, in the brief moment that we have together today, we will try and squeeze in a couple of maybe questions or comments towards the end. Uh, of the presentation by our two speakers. That's if we have uh, enough time. Uh, but also if you'd like to comment, you can uh, just use the um, message box, the chat box below to share your comments and you know communicate and chat with the other people um, in attendance today. Now I would like to introduce our two speakers. Um, Starting with uh, Imru, who seems to be present at the moment. Um, Imru Bakari is a Caribbean African filmmaker and writer. He is a senior fellow in the Faculty of Arts 
at the University of Winchester in the United Kingdom, where he lectures in film studies. And the second speaker who has not joined us yet uh, is um, Jenenia Prosobopa, who is an artist and lecturer at the, of, art, of fine art at the University of Forte in Alice, where in the 1930s, Enes Magnoba was president of the SRC. Greetings, gentle brothers. Um, I will start, if you are ready, um, uh, Imbru, could you please start uh, with your presentation? And thereafter we'll go straight to Pro, if Pro is not around, uh, Bridget Thompson has his paper. She could um, read it for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Um, it is, yes, a really unique honor to be part of this event hosted by the Arts and Ubuntu Trust, whose work I fully support. And more importantly, and making it very special in many ways, the exemplary, what I would refer to as an exemplary African institution, the Constitutional Court Trust of South Africa as part of the Constitutional Court um, as a body. I've been in, invited here to introduce this film or to comment on it, to discuss this film, Reading the Ancestor by Abdul Qadir Ahmed Said, which is now being donated to the Constitutional Court's collection by is being donated by its producers, Thomas Films. Um, in contextualizing my presence here, and um, I feel it necessary to invoke the memory of two individuals, two individuals who will contextualize my presence and the contribution I hope to make to this occasion and in regards to the filmmaker and the film. I want to invoke the memory of Lionel Engakane, 1928 to 2003, and Becky Siswe Peterson, 1961 to 2021. Both happen to be South Africans, and I consider both however, to be luminous figures in the historical and cultural backdrop against which I now speak. Reading the Ancestor was produced in 2006 for an exhibition entitled In the Name of Humanity, the African Spiritual Expression of Robert Ernest Ancoba. Reading the Ancestor, the work which we are uh, referring to particularly now, is the work of a filmmaker with a very unique voice in African cinema. And I think it's necessary for me to elaborate on this a little bit in terms of the importance and the significance of this meeting or this dialogue as I suggest it is. And I think it's been confirmed by others as well. This is a work of video art. It uses digital technology and engages with or in a dialogue with the ancestor. Some 25 years ago, after Mankoba produced the oil canvas, L'Ancestre, Abdul Qadir's film offers what I would call or offered because it was produced in 2006, it offered what I would call a rehistoricizing of this work. Now in the contemporary moment, it can be said that both artists are concerned with bearing witness to their own pursuit for justice. I won't recall in detail Mankoba's narrative about his family history, fleeing persecution, uh, et cetera, and taking refuge in a new community. But it's important to note, it's a well, in, a well noted narrative. I've read it many places and um, others have, have detailed it extensively. I want to suggest, however, there's a parallel here. Abdul Qadir was born in Somalia around the middle of the 20th century and is now living in South Africa. 
and can be seen to be using the imagery and the essential meaning of Mankoba's painting to articulate a statement about his own contemporary predicament of social dislocation. In order to understand this film, and I think we must note this film is only six minutes long. It's a piece of video, six minutes long. But I think we all would agree that it encourages us to relook at it and re return to it. I hope it will be since we've returned to it in this present moment after its production in 2006, return to it again and again in the future. I want to, for those who may not know, and in addition to what has been said in the introduction, to underline the fact that Abdul Qadir is a significant figure in African cinema. His films, particularly the English titles being Tree of Life, which he made in 1988, and Seashells, which he made in 1992, are, I think, indicative of a certain poetic tendency. And I use the term poetic for want of a more definitive term in, at this moment, a poetic tendency within African filmmaking. It is, however, a tendency that is yet to be given serious critical attention. Hopefully, reading The Ancestor will soon inspire that attention through what it inspires and through the, uh, its continued viewing in order to establish, I think, the important significance of the continuity, the continuity in the, of its place in the artist, in the filmmaker's work as a work of his own authorial um, distinction as it were, and in terms of a contribution to African visual culture. The film encompasses many defining elements and themes across Abdul Qadir's work. If you looked at the film just now, you will realize the, the, the structure of it. The painting disappears, is wiped off this frame, but it re-emerges. It re-emerges through a cophony of sound, a cophony of sound that, that signifies a certain history, a certain history of violence, a certain history of, of intrusion, the, 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 the painting then is reconstructed as it were, right? And then in the end, we have the artist himself, Ankoba, bearing testimony. Not only bearing testimony, but bearing testimony to the wholeness of the work itself. The, there are a number of themes across Abdul Qadir's work. And I would suggest that these include, firstly, a knowledge of history, at the center of which are the human sensibilities, those attributes that make us human, and equally, a concern with the violation of the natural environment as a result of various forms of injustice, fratricidal wars, social destruction, and of course, the experience of exile. Abdul Qadir, as has been said, was born in Mogadishu. His family, he, born, he was born into a very um, vibrant, as far as I know, anti uh, family involved in anti-colonial politics at a time when Somalia was still an Italian colony. He studied film and design in Italy, and that's, I think, is significant, as I, as I would hopefully conclude in, in a few minutes. He studied film and design and in Italy and began working in the Somali film and television media. In the 1970s, his work includes roles as being important roles, in fact, in the Somali film agency, the Somali literacy campaign, and the Somali national theater. In African cinema, and this is where the frame of Lionel Engatane and to a great degree, um, Becky Siswe Peterson come into my constellation in a way. Abdul Qadir has been very active in the Federation of Pan African Filmmakers, FEPASI, over the years. He is a founder of Mopafiso, Mopafis, a very important um, forum that was established in Mogadishu, Somalia during the, the 1980s. 
as an extension of Fempasi's work and the FESPACO Fem Festival in Ouagadougou. Abdul Kadi is also a seminal figure in the establishment of the Zanzibar International Film Festival in 1998. Since that time, he has been living in South Africa. He's been working. And of course, I'm sure most of you, all of you will be familiar with his work um, through Rhythms of Africa and the Arts of Ubuntu Trust. So saying that, I can now establish or underline or suggest that the Constitutional Court Trust has to be commended for acquiring reading the ancestor for its art collection. It here now undoubtedly sends a strong message, and I think this has been said earlier, a message from its this institution, which is one that celebrates African art wherever it is produced. It, in this way, it reinforces the significance of this institution as an outcome of the monumental and ongoing struggle that South Africa's history represents. Hence the essential interconnectedness of South Africa with the African continent and the broader African world. I think this is very important. As, a const as the custodian of a growing collection of work, there is the reminder of the essential value of the artists their works of art and the artifacts and materials of heritage, which are an invaluable part of the pursuit of human progress and well being. And I can't help but um, underline this that we are in a moment where the issue of restitution and the return of African art and artifacts and even human remains plundered from Africa by criminals a growing campaign to have these returned and restituted within the historical narrative and experience of the continent and its peoples. Hence, in dialogue with Mankoba and his paintings, this artwork therefore is a reminder that the struggle against injustice is perpetual and must be relentless. I therefore have a great appreciation for both artists and the dialogue which this moment facilitates for us. And hopefully we'll speak further about Nkoba. Um, Bridget Thompson suggested something about the 1930s and its significance. There's some comments I could make on that as part of a wider discussion because that's the very important moment, not only in South Africa's history, but in African global history of which South Africa is an important part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imru, for your insights. Um, Pro, who, oh no, he's just left. Um, I wanted to call on Pro, who's just joined us, uh, to speak on the role of the ancestor in Enes Mangoba's work, but I just, I've just seen that he's uh, he's left again. Um, I'm wondering if Bridget, do you recommend uh, to go to to uh, read the paper as you um, suggested earlier, or should we wait for Pro? Bridget, are you there? Okay, I'm, I'm I'm there. I'm here, and I've got I've got Pro's paper handy, um, but it would be so good if he could speak. He speaks so eloquently on the role of the ancestor. Um, I wonder if we could allow me, if you could allow me, just to try and call him, and maybe if there's anybody who wants to make a quick comment, I'll just try and find out what his technical difficulties are, because we've all got these load shedding problems, and otherwise I'm lined up and I've got his paper here and I can read it. Okay, perhaps I can suggest you do a little introduction and then I will try and get hold of Pro. And so that you don't eat uh, okay, too much time. Okay, good idea, okay. All right. Okay, well, um, as, as, as Zipo um, highlighted, um, um, Pro Mkanyani Sabopa is a lecturer in fine art at the University of Fort Hare, 
where um, Ernest Mangoba was both, um, I think, a forward in the rugby team, where people used to say from the, from the lines, go, go stereo, go, that was his nickname, which, which I explained. And he was also the, the chair of the debating society and I think the president of the SRC. But um, so it's very, uh, very symbolic that pro, um, that I'll be reading Pro's words um, from the University of Fort Hare, and I hope he'll take over from me. Um, he, he I, I, I'm, I'm just going to literally read it because I can't pray see it in, in, you know, at short notice. His paper is called The African Spiritual Expression of Ernest Mangoba, and it will be published in, Francois very mentioned the catalog, which we will be publishing, and it will be available um, online from inquiries at artabuntu.org, as well as various other publications we've made of Ernest Mangoba, you know, over, over the years. So, Ernest Mangoba, in a quest for an intellectual and creative life, left South Africa in 1938, the heyday of colonialism, and took a journey to Europe where he studied fine art at the Ecole Nationale, excuse my French, it's impossible, Supérieure des Arts Décoratives de Paris, a training that he would never get in South Africa as art education was non-existent in black schools at the time. To be a professional artist, black artist was not considered important or was simply unimaginable. This was a state of affairs that forced many artists into exile. Some never returned to South Africa alive. For an African artist like Mangoba, there are no words to describe the shock and alienation he encountered in Europe, arriving in 1938 and living there through the war, part of it spent in, in an internment camp and his life there for many decades after. Having left the country of his birth, he felt displaced and lonely in a foreign land. It can be argued that it was this alienation which led him to paint La Ancette, oil on canvas, 92.3 by 60.3 centimeters, the ancestor, thus symbolically holding onto his ancestral spirits. He took into himself the inescapable heart of his predicament in the painting, the ancestor is charged with emotion, even if its aesthetic language and representation is conceptual and semi-abstract. The painting offers a chance to contemplate the openness and limits of democracy and explores the politics of optimism, of hope and delight, as Guniwe has noted, and it also explores a range of realities, memories and fantasies. In Jeff, the ancestor... Sorry, with it, looks like, it looks like Pro has joined, yes. Okay, fantastic. Then I can stop because if Pro is here, he's, he, there's nobody better than him to speak about the ancestor. I was reading your paper, Pro, but I'll stop now so you can speak. Welcome back. Good day, everyone. Uh, I won't speak much about the paper, but I just to make some few points relating to the ancestor. One, the spirits of the past. Spirits. What I uh, find it also interesting, when I looked at my mobile images, you always have this, what is it called? A stick or that he carries with him everywhere he goes. And actually it was given to him by an old man before he left South Africa and he's carried this stick all along the way to Europe. And the other interesting part for me is that Mangoba and Gerard Zucotto studied together and they were teaching together and they left for Paris together, not at the same year. But I don't find much dialogue between them, which I find it so fascinating. I would love to hear what kind of a dialogue they have when they were living in Europe and in a strange world, in a sense. And both of them never came back alive. So those are kind of my interesting points I would love to raise. Not to say people should actually answer that, but I think I find it so fascinating for me that these two guys were living in Europe at the same era and they were teaching when they left South Africa together. And I don't find a dialogue between these guys unless maybe I'm missing something. But I would love if anyone knows anything about them, maybe can actually unpack that kind of a dialogue because I, 
I think it's an interesting dialogue that I think these guys should have had living in exile, whether you call it safe exile, but to be the center of the art world as Paris was at the time, or France was at the time, to engage with a broader world because South Africa didn't allow them that broader space to discuss issues relating to their art. So uh, if there's anyone who can say anything, I won't say much about the ancestor because Bridget was actually reading the article of which I think you have access to it. So I'll stop from there. All right. Thank you, Pro. Um, I think we ran a little bit uh, out of time, but I'm wondering if, Francois, we can take a couple of questions, if there are any or comments, or do we move uh, forward with your program? Uh, a minute, we can move a minute or two, if anybody has questions, but we can also, in the end, open it up to any of the speakers, I think, I have a Q&A session right at the end. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ipo. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Oh, Pro, you want to go ahead? Uh, I just wanted to say something a bit. Uh, I'm looking at Professor Anduli, I think he might enlighten us about this because I think he was living around that space during that time. If you don't mind. Uh, I think because I'm going to speak, I would then address the issue you have raised. Thank you. Luckily, we do have Professor Ntuli up next. So just as a very short bio, I, I, I don't think I can in a sentence or two do Professor Ntuli justice. Um, Professor Ntuli is a celebrated South African sculptor, poet, writer, and academic. He spent 32 years of his life in exile in Swaziland and the UK. A large sculptural installation of animal bones titled Gaza, Lest We Forget, and another smaller bone sculpture, of course, is held in the CCAC. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the Constitutional Court for uh, giving us this opportunity to, to discuss and to remember and to plot the way you know, forward. And also uh, the, uh, the, the, the Ubuntu Trust uh, for looking after the interest of uh, you know, Ernest uh, in Mangova and all protocols uh, observed. When Mangova uh, came back here for a visit, he came over to visit us in our house and we spent a lot of time uh, you know, together probing and checking and finding out. That's where also the issue of uh, uh, Gerard Sikoto and him you know, came uh, you know, together. And according also to him is that they had compared a lot of notes. You could see similarities from them, moving from realism to abstraction and all. And he also spoke greatly about what was happening at the time, the Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes, Mackay, the, the, the poets in London, Josephine Baker. These were all of the uh, people coming from everywhere. When Mangova speaks about uh, art is for all of humanity, he's speaking about his own lived uh, experience, which was very interesting because it came out from a bleak area when he was uh, born under uh, a colonial uh, 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 you know, star. And as the uh, you know, pro had said that there was no art institution to actually to speak of no culture or of art. Artists during this time were just individual uh, people, you know, doing you know their works, you know, up uh, in, in, in the thirties. What has struck me very interestingly is that he was a very, 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 very spiritual person. Earlier on, when Bridget was speaking, he also 
quoted him saying how sometimes he works from his own subconscious. When we are subconscious, you are not conscious of what exactly is happening, who is actually dealing with you except your ancestors and as well as your, as well as your own spirit, uh, you know, let loose. That's what uh, he, he really, uh, you know, did. Going back to uh, Ahmed's powerful video, it starts with an erasure. Yeah? Colonialism wanted to erase our cultures, erase our belief systems, erase everything. Out of that kind of a, a, a erasure, what comes back are little black dots, which actually tells us that we are moving to Africa, we are moving now to blackness. Things are the country and the continent is on fire. Suddenly, we see the construction, the imagining, the flame there at the bottom, the people, the sounds that are being made, gunshots and all. That tells you that we are talking about humanity that is caught in a web of problems and troubles and therefore spirituality is actually needed. That is where he featured far much more you know, greatly. And it's also very, very, for me, important that when you speak about universality, universalism, and about the common net, you have to look at it also from his own particular experience, meeting with a soldier, you know, fell off, and the wife was also a, 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 a sculptor, together with other Danish people. They say something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Uh, you know, but when we come over to uh, the, the Danes and uh, at Manova, they helped prepare uh, his soul and welcomed him into a very hostile thing. And working up in exile and producing work in exile is not a very, very easy thing. I know it from a very personal uh, you know, experience. People do not want to understand. We have got to find images. We have to find you know, symbols. We have to find expressions that people may not understand, but art, is by its own very nature challenges us to think beyond uh, ourselves, feel beyond a uh, 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 you know, feeling. So he was a very exceptional uh, 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 you know, artist. He, how can I actually uh, 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 you know, put it? Uh, you know, Imru uh, you know, Bakari it, it did for me capture the very, 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 very essence of uh, the spirituality the power, uh, particularly how it is captured and how it is actually uh, interpreted you know, through that film. It's one beautiful thing when two acts of geniuses co-mix and we visualize them. That is why we are visual artists. We imagine and reimagine our past. Let me not speak very much because if there are going to be questions and answers, then we are still going to do it. But before, I, I, and I would like to say that uh, just recently, I uh, won a Global Fine Arts Awards uh, on my exhibition called Azibuyele Emma Sisweni, which is art about spirituality, which is art also about ancestors, which is art also about uh, a, 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 you know, healing. And in doing that, and in getting other people actually involved you know, in it, the image of uh, Mangova and the conversations we had with him, even with Wonga, when he came back, who wanted to push these uh, issues forward on behalf of his own uh, you know, father. We are lucky to have a family of Sonia Feloff, of uh, Ernest, of uh, Wonga, who transcended their Africanness. Uh, there are any things that became human beings who are also truly uh, African, both in spirit, in life, and in flesh. Let me stop there. Thank you, Professor. I'm, I'm sure we'll have some questions at the end. Um, in terms of time and program, we were meant to have a 10 minute tea break at this point. Uh, I'm wondering if we should push ahead or if we should maybe have a very short break. Bridget, do you have any suggestions?
Why don't we have a five minute break, Francois, so everybody can get a cup of tea. Okay, so let's say 10 past 11 will resume. Great, thank you. So next on the program, we have a short video tour that we produced um, the curatorial team, myself, and Tina Mia, my colleague, who's also an assistant curator of the collection. We've been together since, uh, working here together since April, 2018, along with our current graduate intern, Kaylee Fisher. Um, so yeah, we put together a short video to show you where the works we're discussing today are currently installed in the public gallery of the Constitutional Court. Um, and they'll be up until next year, April. So you're all welcome to when you're on Joburg to, to come by and to, to see them in person. Thank you. Hello, we're the curatorial team working on the Constitutional Court Art Collection for the Constitutional Court Trust. My name is Francho Leon Cachet, I'm one of the two assistant curators, and I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Tina Mia, I'm also one of the assistant curators. Hi, I'm Kaylee Fisher, I am the current graduate curatorial intern. Here we have the foyer of the Constitutional Court. And the idea of this short video tour is to give you an idea of where the works are installed that we'll be speaking about today. The very first work you see is our star for the day, arguably, Joseph and Lovu's Inspired by the Ancestor, which is based on the original painting by Ernest Mangoba. It was recently conservation framed and treated in Cape Town by conservator Louise Manel and framed by Davis Lewis Brown Framers. It was one of our large conservation framing projects of 2020. And right next to it, you have the bust of a young Ernest Mangoba by Dorothy Randall. Both of these works will be spoken to by my colleagues in, in just a bit. It is also worth noting that where inspired by the ancestors currently installed just two months ago we had the very first artwork of the constitutional court art collection also by joseph and lovu a handwoven tapestry titled humanity that was installed in this very same spot it is like it is significant to have this series titled 30 years in soweto installed right next to these two works the series looks at the commemoration of 30 years after the Soweto up uprisings in 1976. And the works closest to the Joseph and Lovu handwoven tapestry is by two old friends of Joseph and Lovu. This top one titled After the Wedding by Vincent Beloy, and this one Resilience by Charles or Sakaya Charles Nkosi, both friends of Joseph and Lovu. And then we also have this Helen Sabidi work titled Elders Gifts, which is quite significant seeing as we'll be looking at spirituality, African spirituality, and the role that ancestors play in our understanding of our shared heritage and humanity. Moving on, we have three works by the youngest artists represented in the CCAC. Richard Specks in the Monday. He donated them to us in 2020. And then moving on a bit more, we have the drawings of Barbara Tyrrell, ethnographic drawings that she made between the years of 1940 and 1950. And then quite significantly, we also have the beadwork that she donated to the CCAC alongside her drawings that she collected 
by purchase, purchasing them or as gifts from her sitters. It is special to have these works on display as well, seeing as Ernest Monroba's work is inspired by the colors and patterns of Southern African beadwork. And then the video artwork, which we'll also be looking at a bit later on, is installed right here. We did switch off the screen just to reduce the sound, but we'll be seeing the video a bit later on. I'll briefly be introducing Josephine Drovu's tapestry inspired by the ancestor, which was donated to the Constitutional Court Trust in 2017 by the Arts and Ubuntu Trust. This woven work is based on Ernest Mangova's painting, The Ancestor, seemingly abstract but rich in depth. The Ancestor pays tribute to Mangova's ancestry as well as to the heritage of South Africa, the artist's land of birth. Mangova drew inspiration for this work from a story his mother, front, from a story his mother, Florence Mangova, a devoted keeper of her family's history, told him about his great grandmother. According to Elsa Miles, the story left an indelible impression on Mangova. When the Mfengus could not come to terms with the, despot the despotism of King Shaka, they searched for and found a new home among the Tosas in Transkai, where they, who called themselves destitute wanderers, made a success of cattle farming. Among the Mfengus who fled with the Zulu forces in hot pursuit was the Mangangwana, Mangova's maternal kin. In their group was an aged great-grandmother, she was so old and weak that the younger members had to carry her. When after a few days she realized that she was an impediment to the flight of her people and that the distance between her and her pursuers was decreasing, she ordered them to leave and to proceed without her. It was in Mangova's modest flat in Paris on the evening of 15 September 1990 when the artist recalled the significant moment in his family's history. In conclusion, he said, she stood and they walked. She waved and she waved. It was the last they saw of her because she saw that she hindered quicker practical progress, so she sacrificed herself. In the room followed a moment's reverent silence. Then a deeply touched listener whispered and pointed to the painting in the corner above the artist's bed. Ernest, there she is. Solemnly, the artist replied, thank you. Mangova, who left South Africa for Europe in 1938, very seldom gave illustrative titles to his pieces, the ancestor being one of a few exceptions. He added the title when the Johannesburg Art Gallery acquired the work for its permanent collection. The Arts and Ubuntu Trust recognized that this work could translate well into a tapestry on the advice of Stephen Wells and Sakaya Charles in Corsi, and this was why Joseph and Lobu was commissioned to create this woven piece. The weaving of the ancestor was the final artwork Joseph and Lobu completed before falling ill. Mangova commented that the lines and colors he used for his work, closely mimicked by Ndlovu, came directly from his subconscious without deliberate intervention in a manner that he described as almost Freudian. Correspondingly, the final meaning that he developed in the consciousness of the viewer, Mangova said, once the image begins to speak to you, then the message is there. I'll be introducing um, the bust of Ernest Mangoba by Dorothy Randall, donated by the Arts and Ubuntu Trust in 2017. The bust is of young Ernest Mangoba in 1935, completed in 1936. It is made of bronze casting from plaster original by Etienne de Kock in 2016. When Randall studied arts in Makanda, a young Ernest Mangoba was sweeping leaves outside her studio. She needed a model and approached him, not knowing he was a sculptor working on an art commission in town. Years later, Randall learned her sitter's identity in her 90s, handed over the work to be placed in a public collection. And lastly, we have Abdul Qadir Ahmed Sahid's interpretation of Ernest Mangoba's The Ancestor, 
titled Reading the Ancestor. This video artwork was made in 2006 and was donated by Bridget Thompson and Thomas Films in 2021. It is an artistic interpretation of Ernest Mwoba's oil painting, The Ancestor, symbolizing Africa's history of oppression and resistance, complementing Mwoba's spiritual iconography. Mwoba expressed the need to preserve African heritage as a shared heritage of humanity, as does Joseph Mwoba's Humanity, the very first work of the Constitutional Court Art Collection. Thank you. And as I, as I previously mentioned that we're, we're trying to get the original painting, uh, the original, the ancestor from Johannesburg Art Gallery, and we hope to install it next to uh, Broad Joe's tapestry and the bust by Dorothy Randall in the next month or so. And um, uh, please keep a lookout on our social media channels. We'll, we'll announce as soon as it's up in the gallery. Next up, we, we have Justice Albi Sachs. It's a, it's a great honor to have him with us today. Um, I can't read his full biography, it's, it's too much, but I, I can say that he's an emeritus member of the CCAC Artworks Committee. Um, and he, he played a seminal role with uh, the inception of the Constitutional Court Art Collection. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an honor to have him here today. Um, Justice Sachs, over, over to you. Uh, yes, hello everybody. I prefer being called Judge LB or just plain LB. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a very, I think, interesting story about Joseph and Global. The story with a beautiful beginning and a beautiful ending and a middle. And let me explain what, what, what I'm getting at. Uh, I'd never heard of him. Uh, I knew I was the judge on constitutional court. I was very excited. I'm with 10 colleagues of mine. We're sitting on borrowed chairs. We had nothing. Temporary office accommodation. We didn't have a building. We didn't have a library. We didn't have towns. We didn't have rules. We had a constitution. We had a long history of struggle. And we had a very beautiful mandate to help bring justice to South Africa, torn, divided, apartheid driven South Africa, pain South Africa. And at our very first meeting, sitting on borrowed chairs, we didn't even have a single chair, Arthur Chaskelson, the head of the court, the Camp Chief Justice, distributed tasks. And he asked Sally Medalla to help us with the gown once he decided to have a gown. And Kato Regan, to work on a thing called computers, which were very, very new. And Lori Ackerman to do the library. Uh, and Islam Muhammad to do the rules of court. And in the end, there were two people left with nothing. You had to find something for us. Yvonne Mokoro and Albin Sachs. They said, can you look after that call? We had temporary accommodation. And he said, you'll have 10,000 rand. Now, if you look at the constitutional court today, and you look at the artwork collection and so on, I'm telling you the beginnings of all that. It didn't just come to pass. It was Yvonne and myself, but at a very special moment in South African history of transformation, of change, of hope. And with the 10,000 rand, we decided to get one decent work of art that could somehow establish the spirit of the new Constitutional Court of South Africa. We knew what we didn't want. We didn't want the Magna Carta. We didn't want the blindfolded women imported from Europe with the scales of justice. We didn't quite know what it was all about. We wanted something that was South African that was African. The people who fought hardest for our constitution were the broad mass of African people, mostly poor. We wanted something of that energy, not the spiritualism as such, but the energy of liberation, the energy of, and the term Ubuntu wasn't used in those days, but that's what they were searching for, to be the first artwork, the first visual sign in the new constitutional court. And we went to a local a gallery, I think it was the Berman Gallery, that was quite close to the building we were in, looked around and I saw work by and I look, you see down the bottom right hand side of the picture, Joseph and Global and Global. Ah, and Global. This is 
the wish has got the feeling that you want, the character, the spirit that you want. And the, um, I forget the first name, but Matt, I put a Ms. Berman said, I can introduce you to the artist. And came back sometime later, met this very, very quiet, very silent person. There's some artists uh, who speak beautifully and paint beautifully and sculpt beautifully powerfully. Uh, and some talk beautifully, that's fantastic. But some artists are very shy, very quiet, very inward. Uh, and they put that energy into the work they do. And the sense I got of Joseph Global, he was the latter. And we decided we wanted a tapestry, not just a painting. And the tapestry was woven. And with that one work from an artist who we had met and known before, we established, if you like, you know, when, when the orchestra is uh, starting to play, everybody's making all the different noises, somebody gives a keynote in the sense that humanity, tapestry, became the keynote for the whole artist. So that's, that's the lovely opening of it. It exhausted our whole budget. From then onwards, it was big, borrowing, stealing, pressurizing, beguiling, getting artists to contribute, galleries to contribute, and a beautiful collection emerged. The beautiful latter part is Joseph and Global, almost the last year of his life, weaving this magnificent tapestry of a magnificent painting linking up with the real pioneering Black African artist who refused to be categorized as somebody who can only do craft, art is not for you, who refused to be a township artist, or refused to be even a protest artist in that way that so many people were categorized and went to Europe. Went to Europe and became one of the pioneering modernist artists in Europe, never forgetting his roots, uh, deeply inspired by the memories, ancestral memories, producing this magnificent picture and that painting, then becoming the last major piece of labor of Joseph and Global, spending almost a year getting that, that, that wonderful piece. So Joseph and Global, we owe you. We owe you, we owe you giving us that keynote for the whole collection and establish Maybe it's the only constitutional court, Supreme Court in the world that has pictures not of dead white male judges, not just pictures of, of, of um, uh, artists uh, connected directly with the law, uh, but something that has that spirit of humanity, the spirit of Ubuntu that's central to our whole project. So this has been a very inspiring uh, morning for me. Uh, and and uh, it's wonderful to see a professionalization which of what was a completely amateurish beginnings, but an amateurish with serendipity, with passion, with fun, with enthusiasm, huge support from the arts community. It got the artist's collection going. Now it's, it's, it's amazing for me and thrilling for me to see the collection being appreciated and the artists who contributed in particular all by now. Uh, being given a place of honor in the court, the court that plays such an important role in our country today. Thank you, CCAC. Uh, thank you, Bridget Thompson and the Ubuntu Art and Ubuntu Trust. Uh, and thank you in particular, everybody who's put together uh, this, this, this terrific program this morning. Thank you very much, Albi. Um, sorry, I, I lost connection for a little while there. We're having some internet problems at the court with load shedding. I, I hope you can all hear me. I'm, I'm going to give over to, to Stacey Forster, a South African-born Amsterdam-based curator, researcher, and lecturer in cultural analysis. From 2012 to 2016, she acted as curator of the Constitutional Court's art collection, which was subject of a doctoral dissertation, South Africa's Constitutional Court Art Collection, curating justice after apartheid. Stacey, over to you. Thank you so much, Francois. And I, um, I want to thank all of you. I feel humbled 
to be part of this conversation and to be joined by so many elders. Many of you are cited and quoted in my doctoral dissertation. Um, and so it feels really an honor to be here and to know that we are being joined by the many ancestors whose lives and hands and work and spirit are invested into these incredible artworks. Um, I was hoping to share my screen and maybe uh, whoever's hosting the event can make that possible for me, because I think that what is so important about these uh, about bringing artworks into the constitutional court is really understanding the material culture. And uh, Professor Bakari said it really passionately and importantly that our material culture, the objects, the materiality of our beings have been looted and have been denied their presence in the world in, in so many different ways. So I want to uh, re-highlight what LB shared with us in that moment that him and uh, Justice uh, Yvonne Mohoro chose not to just spend that money on scatter cushions, not to imagine this court space as a corporate office with, uh, you know, Mr. Price version paintings on the wall, but really to invest in an artist and in to invest in an object I'm doing this with my hands because I've had the privilege and the luxury to even touch Joseph and Lovu's tapestry that was donated to the court and even the process of weaving. I feel like I've been able to kind of commune with uh, Joseph and Lovu by that moment of connecting with, um, with the artwork. So I'm sharing my screen here and let me just pop this onto slide share and I imagine you can all see it, yes? Good. So what I wanted to, uh, to highlight is, yes, Joseph and Lovu's original work, uh, that was the first piece, the keynote piece, as Albi mentioned, of the Constitutional Court, has become a very important part of my life. And uh, this is because I began curating the art collection in 2012. And now I realize that it's almost a decade later, and I've spent 10 years looking at these works, looking at them very closely. And this work is titled Humanity. And because we are all on Zoom, I think we forget that this is a real object in the world and that this is an object that has not only traveled through the world, but has touched many lives along the way. I was included now. And one of my favorite things to do when I was curator of the court, and I'm sure the present curators will know the feeling, was to take children around the space. So I, um, I had a wonderful tour once where I had about 30 young school children, wide eyed, full of hope, full of optimism for the future, so inspired to be in the constitutional court. And we began a discussion on what is humanity? What is human dignity in the context, in the context of the constitutional court? And how can we use these artworks to help us better understand those concepts? So we looked carefully at, uh, at Joseph and Lovu's work, Humanity, and we thought about what are these different elements of the work that help us to understand the artist's idea of humanity. And we noticed these figures are joined together in a huddle. So the children, the teachers and I joined together in a huddle. This is something we, we think about very differently now, of course, in the context of the, of the pandemic, but we joined together in this very intimate moment of being close to each other. We closed our eyes. If you look carefully at the painting, you'll see that the eyes of the figures are all closed. We closed our eyes and of course, young children, there were a few giggles, a little bit uncomfortable to be joining together in this way. But what we realized in that silence, that moment of huddling together, in that moment of vulnerability, you close your eyes and you let yourself just be in this environment, we realized the power of empathy. And that's the lesson that I think Joseph and Lovu's first tapestry gives to us in the Constitutional Court. It helps us to imagine what human dignity and what freedom uh, can mean for us as a young democracy. And I want to bring together some of the, the di different threads of my PhD thesis. One of them, uh, some of you, particularly Prof. Ntuli and 
uh, LB will be very familiar with is LB's paper, famous paper in 1990, controversial paper, where he wrote about the role of culture in a free South Africa, in a democratic post-apartheid South Africa. And he suggested we should prepare ourselves for freedom. And I won't get into the controversies of the several statements he made, but if anyone wants to know, I can spend hours talking about it. But what he was highlighting there and what this choice to commission an artwork and to create an art collection for the Constitutional Court, the choice was about understanding the fundamental role that artists have in our society. And that role is to imagine the future. That role is to tell stories and to bring together these abstract ideas in the material world and to provide a kind of a holding point, a moment, a tether into the world for spiritual consciousness. So I wanted to uh, show you that work and place it in relation to uh, Ernest Manhoba's incredible statement. He said this in an interview in 2003, that the first condition for entering the world of the spiritual expression we call art is to be open to the other. Now this painting and this quote for me have so much in common because they speak about this idea of bringing each other together in the spirit of Ubuntu, in the idea of knowing each other, opening ourselves up to each other, recognizing each other in a particular way. Of course, uh, it was wonderful to see my former colleagues and uh, the new curatorial team showing us around the new installation in the Constitutional Court. At my time, this is where Joseph and Lovu's original tapestry hung. And I love seeing it here because it gives us a sense of its scale and its materiality in the court but also how it relates to the other work. So now I see it being related to uh, Vincent Beloy's work, Charles uh, Sukaya and Corsi's work, uh, Helen Sabidi's work. Here it was in relation to a portrait of Nelson Mandela. And one of the things I've always wondered is whether these uh, figures in Joseph and Lovu's work are actually portraits of the judges in some kind of way, right? They speak to these impartial figures, opening themselves up to the public, to the citizenry of South Africa, and trying to understand how to shape our constitution. And it just reminded me of so many of the elders in the world. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, the ancestor tapestry and, of course, the original tapestry by Joseph and Lovu. And I just wanted to uh, stress by viewing this work, the idea of repetition, of weaving. And I noticed in the, in the chat, uh, our colleague Hannah was talking about how the film might be a violation of, uh, of Ernest Manhoba's original work. And it was so fascinating to me because this idea of copying, of plagiarism, of stealing, this is a Western notion. This is a notion of understanding individual genius. But we know that our community of, of practice in South Africa particularly has been a, a practice of sharing. And I must say there are definitely connections between Gerard Sokoto's work, between Ernest Manhoba's work, and now of course, between Joseph Ndlovu's work. And we can stretch even further back to some of the training that many of these artists undertook in, uh, in Rourke's Drift uh, particularly. And this is a, a, an image of Alina Ndebele, who was one of Joseph Ndlovu's teacher, teachers. And um, this is one of her tapestries, which is developed in this kind of free weaving style. And we can see the, the symbolic or the um, aesthetic links between this work and Joseph and Lovu's future works. We can also see it in other elements of the court's design and collection. So this is an image which many of you will uh, recognize as familiar, those of you who move around the constitutional court space. This is one of the judge's offices. And these carpets, so we're moving from a weaving on the wall to a carpet on the floor, but both are as meaningful in the way they help us understand this material trace of the ancestors. Um, these carpets were designed 
based on a painting by Sufiso Kamikame's work. Uh, and so what I'm hoping you're able to see by all of these different threads, there's our metaphor for weaving, these different threads bring together all these different hands, lives and stories that are helping us to imagine what humanity and human dignity are in the context of justice and the constitutional course, court. I hope that I could show these two side by side as well. On the left hand side, we have Joseph and Lovu's work. On the right, the original painting by Ernest Mantoba. And it's incredible to see how the work is the same, but shifts and changes across these different media. What I'll do, of course, in future is I'll also include an image of the film because we can start to see that shift again. But that act of retracing, that act of close looking is really what grounds us in that uh, moment of spiritual expression. So all these lives are interconnected. Uh, as I think um, Kaylee started to gesture towards there is an element of kind of ancestry in terms of the mother figures that we see in uh, Ernest Mantoba's painting of the ancestor, recalling this grandmotherly figure. And of course, uh, we also see other traces to past ancestors from all over the world. So uh, in the painting, you can see here, if you look very carefully, you'll see this rounded uh, section over here and the triangle over there and almost like a kind of little stick figure body uh, at the bottom there and this is definitely highlighted in the film so when you go back and watch that you can really notice this figure this is one of Ernest Mantoba's drawings um, re relating to this incredible reliquary, reliquary sculpture um, by the Bakota people uh, and really, again, drawing out ancestors and conversations from all over the world. And finally, to bring another element to the story is to recognize how, um, what's the word, serendipitous many of these connections are. I only happened to get a job at the Constitutional Court curating the collection. It has directed my life in a very particular way. It has allowed me to commune with these artists, with these elders. And in that same haphazard way, Dorothy Randall bumped into Ernest Mantoba as a young man and was able to kind of craft this new piece of material culture, this additional moment holding of the, of the ancestor. And so I've got a little photograph to show you of Dorothy Randell, who was the artist who produced the portrait, that's her and her husband, fascinating histories of uh, their political activity in the 1930s in Grahamstown and particularly in relation to law. And uh, of course, I have to mention too, Elsa Miles, who was the art historian who brought Ernest Mantoba's work to light in South African art histories, which of course are so plagued by the erasure of black artists narratives, as uh, LB mentioned, the kind of relegation of black artists this work to these very fixed and constructed categories like township work or like craft or whatever the case is. So uh, what, I, what I hope I could show you through those uh, short kind of wondering ideas is just the way that art is allowing us in the space of the constitutional court to remind us the importance of storytelling, of the interconnectedness of our lives, and to return to Mantoba's initial idea is that art, for it to be an experience of spiritual expression, is importantly this moment of opening up to the other. And what an incredible way to start understanding the concept of Ubuntu. So thank you very much for allowing me to share some of that with you and to be able to learn from so many of you today. Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, next up, we have Bongiwe Rekiso. Bongiwe is a doctoral fellow at the Department of History at the University of the Western Cape and the co-recipient of the 2021 Ivan Karp Doctoral Research Award from the African Crit Critical Inquiry Program. Bongiwe, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me just try to put my video on. Um, can you guys hear me? <laughs> you just can't see me, right? 
<laughs> I don't know what's wrong with my video. Um, let me just see. I think something. No. Uh, okay, let me rather go ahead because I'm not sure what's wrong with the video, but it is not allowing me. Um, okay. Thank you so much, um, Stacey, for the beautiful paper. I read through it. And um, <clears throat> some of the comments of the questions that I had, you actually address them right now. Because I was, um, okay, let me just start from the start. Um, I was actually very happy in how the paper read in terms of you were able to provide us with different categories. So obviously the first category was how the work was commissioned by the Constitutional Court, how it got to the Constitutional Court. And I think the backstory was actually great for some of us and other people that don't really have that type of knowledge of how did the work itself get to the Constitutional Court. And also some of the other stuff that you talked about was the communion. And um, to me, then it spoke about the collective um the passing of knowledge which you actually spoke about about it right now when you were referring to uh to the assistant curator that was saying that isn't it stealing work from the other person or copying um uh, Moba's work and you actually addressed that when we were talking about um working in communion or having a collective or sharing ideas which is where you started mentioning the different names uh you spoke about uh, and to Al Umamo Alina, who's the one that was actually teaching Opera Joseph about um, teaching how to weave. And, and also maybe the last part that I also, um, that was also interesting to me was how you were reading these different works and how you were putting them together in dialogue. And I was actually um, very interested in for instance, you were referring to the ancestor of Ubabu Mangoba and you were referring to Ubabu Joseph's land, um, ancestor tapestry. And as you were talking about these two works, you started mentioning that the work of Ubabu Prajo, uh, when you look at the ancestor in the tapestry, it seems as if it's residing like it's almost it's going backwards instead of being in the forefront or more pronounced as it is on the on the on the paintwork of to me that was quite interesting because then i wanted to understand maybe what is your take on that because i had different um ideas why is that possible or maybe why is it the way that it is in terms of probably it's because of the technique that uh, Ubabu Mangoba was using paint and Ubabu Joseph is using uh, tapestry, um, sorry, is using e weaving, weaving wool. So that will also might have been part of the reasons why it came out the way that it did. And also the fact that Ubabu Joseph also wanted to have his own interpretation of the work that it it doesn't necessarily have to be the exact copy, but he wanted to put his own stamp on it and also the thoughts that was going through him when he was actually weaving that uh, particular uh, art piece. And also the other thoughts that came to mind is in terms of culture, because culture and spirituality and ancestors, because as time from the time of Baba Ngoba and the time of when Ubabu Joseph started working on this piece, the times were quite different in terms of spirituality and ancestors. People were seeing ancestors in a different manner than then. And probably that's also what Ubabu Joe might have tried to portray to, to show a sort of shift. Those are just my ideas and my thoughts. It doesn't necessarily mean that's what it means, but those are the kind of things that came to mind. Because if you look right now, then you can see now again, spirituality is like in the upfront, people are talking more about spirituality. People are talking more about ancestors and all of those things, which is in relation to what was happening in the past during the time of Ubabu Mangoba when he was bringing that um, to the forefront. So those were the type of questions that I had in my own mind. And I also loved the way, uh, the, I also loved how you 
you played with the metaphor of weaving. Like for instance, when you refer to the to the art piece, the humanity art piece, and you're talking about these people being woven together, and you refer to the when you refer to them, you say that, um, let me just see that piece. You were saying that it is echoing the medium and evoking the communion of sorts. I love that how you say that it is evoking the medium, like it is echoing the medium, which is the medium of trade, which is the medium of weaving. So I actually enjoyed that very much. And so those were the type of things that I, that I, that, that were in my mind while reading your, um, your paper. And the only things that, um, that I would have loved to have seen would have been you talking more about color because color is very important to Babu Cho. So like even when he starts in one of, one of his interviews, when he first speaks about color, he talks about um, how, how weaving the different tones and colors that are used in weaving, how they are totally different from paintings. The mere fact that um, wools and the tones that they produce are more pronounced, they are more contrast, they are like bright and vibrant. Whereas the colors that you get from paintings are totally different. They are more, um, they are more undertones. They are not that, they are not so bright as the colors that you get in weaving. And also the type of relationship that Ubabu Joe had with, um, with color. Because um, in, in one of four example, um, what we understand about color ourselves is that we are told that um, we are told about how our psych, our own psych um, relates to color. Some say that color is etched in our culture psychologically and biologically. As a result, the use of color in weaving gives meaning and aesthetic feel that provides the, dynam the dynamism. And in Prajo's work, that's what he refers to. He talks about the different colors that he will actually like, for instance, he made an example when he visited the exhibition of Babu Manova and he saw these different colors that we taken from beadwork. And he also started using those colors in his own work. And he talks about how color has a meaning to Nguni people, to different groups. So like for Abe Kosa, the color will mean totally something totally different. Like for instance, traditional healers using white when they, they do their traditional work, like white umpak or white vest, which will pro with which um which refers to purity. And then you get your your oranges that are across our ways, and that will mean that this person is married, this one is single, this is one is about to get married. So colors had a lot of of meaning to Brajo and and he liked um he liked using those to showcase his type of psych or where he was when he was trying to work on these different works. And um let me just see my last point uh before I finish the time I think five minutes is over. So yeah so I also love the fact that you also talked about um the repetition in weaving, because it's so important that we understand the repetition, the repetition in weaving, because Babu Joe says that he found solace and comfort in that. That's why he did, he loved doing weaving. He would sit on his own and he would start working on his loom and he would start doing this repetition. It was sort, it was somehow something that comforted his psyche and he enjoyed doing those things. So yeah, but I think for now, let me stop there. The only last thing I would also have loved um, that we will talk about are the shapes. The shapes that you see in the ancestor and the shapes that you see in the in Babu Joe's uh, work, those shapes which are similar to beadwork shapes as well, because that's what Babu, um, Babu Joe really, uh, refers us to or highlights as well is that the shapes that he was using 
are the shapes that you saw in beadworks. And obviously we know the different shapes that are used in beadworks, they mean different things as well in terms of like uh, Aba Zulu, like Zulu people will refer to them as love letters that they will use when they want to get, um, they will want to date a girl or they will get married. Then they will do these beautiful beadworks with different colors and different shapes that will mean different things. So, um, so those are the only things that I would love, maybe if we were, would have looked at it in dialogue with the different um, works that we looked at. Also the last point will be the humanity. Um, I think the question that I wanna leave with everyone else, cause I sort of have my own answers will be, why was it important for Babu Joe not to use, um, I will put it in inverted commas that why didn't he not use like normal skin tones to represent these 11 people on that humanity uh, uh, tapestry? Because to me, I know what it means based on reading the work itself. But then I think we also need to maybe think, let be a thought for today. Why not the same color? Like why not the different colors? Like how a black person looks, how a white person looks, how a colored person looks. But then he chose like tones that are totally different from how we look like to actually represent Ubuntu or humanity. So that's it. Thank you guys. Thank you, Bongiwe. I really think um, Stacy's contribution and, and your response to that is, um, is very mutually enriching. Um, we'll, be, we'll be moving into the section where we give an opportunity to uh, friends and family of both Bra Joe and Ernest Mandnova uh, to share um, their recollections of their relationship with these two artists and also to share anecdotes about and, and their memories. And, and first off, we have Tato and Lovu, who, um, the current curatorial team. We've been lucky enough to have her at the court a few times uh, to come see her dad's work and to engage with her. We, we conducted an interview with Tato, uh, which was transcribed and which in time will be made available on our website uh, as part of our ongoing interview program with artists represented in the collection and affiliates um, like Tato. It's great to have you here today. Uh, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Francois. Um, sure. It's a very emotional day, uh, I must say. Um, I'd like to thank the Constitutional Court, Ubuntu Trust, um, Judge Albi Sex, um, Babu Charles, Babu Vincent. Um, if it wasn't for the Three Musketeers, wherever dad went, Bob Charles and Bob Vincent would always be there. Um, how dad's work got to where it got to was with them in tow. In dad's final moments when he did uh, Bob Manuva's work, it was a tough time for all of us. Um, I'm truly, truly thankful and grateful um, to Bridget, uh, to, to Bongi. Um, for capturing this for us as the children who are left behind, who we then be able to share it with our families. Um, you keep a history of our lives forever for our children too. So it's not just uh, the work itself, it, it's the memories, it's everything. Um, when I look at the, 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 the pictures that Bridget played, um, when, when the loom used to sit inside this house and um, dad would painstakingly work at creating the physical loom, at stringing it up, at weaving it night and day, different light fixtures to get the right lighting. I, I loved what Bongiwe said um, regarding color. Um, he really, really, um, utilizes the, the natural tones of uh, human beings. Um, I used to be so fascinated because he would draw a hobo and he'd be a very colorful guy. Um, and in the real world, it doesn't look like that. I'm so grateful and so thankful for the, the taking care of the work, as particularly from the curators. 
Um, I know I visit you guys a lot, <laughs> but I'm so, so grateful for, for, for keeping those uh, for us and, and maintaining them in the manner that they are in. It took that months to create those pieces. And um, yeah, it, it's so beautiful to be a part of the process um, where the artists are all together speaking about the work and the curators and the, the judges. And, and this whole coordination is, 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 is super amazing. It, it's amazing. It, I just wanna thank you all very, very much. Um, it's two years now since dad is, is not physically with us. Um, but in his last moments, he was weaving um, before he passed. Um, it's true. Um, it was one of the mediums he enjoyed the most. Um, and I'm so, so grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and very thankful. Um, for what you have done for us today and for all the days and all the years and everything that's put up, all your efforts mean the world to us. And the pain and everything that um, we get to process because of how you've kept his work and how you talk about his work and we get to reprocess and, and heal. And it, it's true, art, art really, really goes beyond. Um, it gives us a point of expression and I highly appreciate that. Um, so thanks. I think that's it for me before I go into a well of tears. Thank you, Tato. Next, we have Sandiswa Nguni, uh, the other daughter of, of Joseph and Lobu Raja. Sandiswa, are you there? Yes, um, I'm here. Um, greetings, everyone, and thank you for this um, wonderful opportunity to hear everyone, you know, speak about my dad and his art and everything. Um, I didn't grow up really with him, but knowing his work, you know, because we do have his art collection at home in KZN as well. So I will kind of like think to me because I'm not a, 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 like an artist like um, my other sister Shengiwe and Hato who like got to inherit his kind of um, the, the, the art and um, into finance and everything. Um, so yeah, so I will think of the cartoons. It's like just another cartoon, but now like hearing you guys, you know, giving meaning to his work it kind of like taking me, taking me to another place where I never thought um, art could be interpreted like that. Um, I know he has been passionate about his weaving, about his art, and that way he found peace and solace. Um, I remember when um, when he had to get the the loom that he was working on for the for for for, for, for the last art, the tapestry that he did. I was the one escorting him to go look for the wood and everything just to structure and to give it to people to design. And I know two, I think two couple of the tenor stands to say it's it's big, such a big project and it needed uh, the certain amount of time. And he was rushing against his, uh, the time that he was given to. So we had to uh, go someplace where he was able to be assisted and, um, Wow, yeah, I'm kind of like emotional too, just like Tato, but um, definitely um, we, we are grateful and we are thankful that um, you had to invite us to be part of this and for us to share it with uh, uh, the generation to come. I have a daughter, you know, who always like disturb my father when he's doing his work. So he'll say, mommy, um, Mkulu is dating up the place. So she would like to tidy up and take Mkulu's equipment and say, no, Nana Mkulu is working. So my father to entertain her, he, he will give her a, a, a A4, blank A4, and all his, um, I don't know, it's called custom pencils or crimes or whatever, just for her to be on her corner and do her artwork. But I think she took after me, she didn't, 
you know, take after Mkulupata, I would love her to persuade us. And yeah, we are so grateful and thankful to everyone. And if um, I can request the recording for my other sister because she wanted to be a uh, part of this, but uh, she couldn't. So I, I would love for her to see and hear what her father's work as she is an, an artist as well. My father, the last uh, loom he did, it was for her and she's doing beading with that loom. She's not like weaving, uh, using wool, she used beads. Um, yeah, just, um, but I think she will love this recording. Thank you very much, everyone. And Tato, don't cry that much. Our father is happy. And so we must uh, carry on his legacy by being happy for him. Thank you. Thank you, Sintiswa. Um, next up, we have Elaine Spielman, a family friend of Manjoba. Okay, hello. Well, uh, during the years 1974 and 1975, with Claudette, my decent wife, we met Sonia Fellow and Ernest Mankoba. They were Charlie Chevalier's good friend. Charlie was then the owner of an art gallery in the center of Paris in Les Halles area. He had recently visited the Silkeborg Museum in Jutland, Denmark, and met Trolls Anderson, who introduced us to Sonia's fellow work and invited us to go to see them in Paris. Sonia, Ernest, and their son, Mark, lived and worked in a very tiny flat on the ground floor in a shop transformed in a studio. The entrance door opened directly to the main room, who was used as a living room and as Sonia's studio. And in his own studio, also on the ground floor, located at a close walking distance. In his painting, Ernest Mankoba assert profound confidence in human being. That deliberate positive assertion was, in a way, part of his personal answer to the really difficult living condition he had to face and overcome. He experienced heart difficulties, suffering during his lifetime from injustice, discrimination, racism, solitude, apartheid, poverty. Man is one, that's all he used to say. Whatever your origin, your skin color, your history, your creed, your particularities, Man is universal. In many, in many of Ernest's oil painting, it's possible to discover a human being in between the tones of the canvas, subtle but nonetheless present, really well there, living. Interrupted lines, drawn lines, mild marks, gentle colors give life to that man who emerge. Man is universal and l'ancêtre a comes out of the painting. It is Paris, the world art capital, at the beginning of the 20th century that Ernest Van Koba chose to go to study and live in 1938. There, he met artists from all over the world and Sonia, who became his wife, colleague, life companion. He was a sculptor, he became a painter. Ernest and Sonia were friends with many people, their neighbor, the artist Alberto Giacometti, who held Mark Wanga in his arm when he was a child, the South African artist Sekoto, the painter Miro, the Danish, Dutch, Belgian painters such as Asger Jorn and Bile. They were member, members of the Artistic Cobras group. They were friends with the friend painter Decotex, with the model Clarice Panso, and with a lot of others. Ernest and Sonia were concerned with all the artistic research and question which emerged, particularly after the Second World War. With his family, Ernest lived in Montparnasse, the then epicenter of a thriving artistic scene in Paris, 
in the south of Paris on the left bank between La Rue du Château and Rue Maison Dieu, Ernest and Sonia created their work, exchanging, dialoguing between them, each working in their studio for the good of humanity, for the man as a universal being. Ernest used to read each day the Times. He was happy to be in Paris, happy to be free to live. This, he did his painting and works without any compromise. When we came to visit them, Sonia moved a bit her sculptures in progress, and we sat around a small table and discussed for hours of all sorts of subjects, Shakespeare, Kierkegaard, African traditions, British Empire, social movements, Van Gogh, Antonin Artaud, children, education, journeys, etc., etc. And as regularly asserted his hope in man against a difficult world context, and always mentioned his happiness to be free to live in France. The beautiful, moving tapestry, L'Ancêtre, following the old painting done by Ernest Van Koba in 1968-1970, completed in South Africa by master weaver Brad Joseph Lovu, brings us today an immense joy and a lot of happiness. What a happy day. The celebration of art and Ubuntu Trust donation to the Constitutional Court Trust and the Constitutional Court Art Collection promote hope, Ernest Moncoba's hopes in humanity and in man as universal being is are living and inspiring. Well, that's all. And uh, I suggest now to, to listen to my friend Charlie Chevalier, and he will speak in French, but he, he don't speak English, and I will translate uh, his words. <laughs> all right. Est-ce qu'on va te voir? Approche-toi. Alors, Ernest est passé une grande partie de son existence à Paris. Ernest lived a large part of his life in Paris. À cette période, l'Europe accueillait tout ce qui se faisait de nouveau ou d'important en peinture. At that period, Europe welcomed all that was new or all was important in painting. Voilà. Et il a connu entre autres Giacometti et il a fait partie du groupe Cobra avec sa femme Sonia. He knew Giacometti and belonged to the Cobra groups with his wife Sonia. Ils se sont connus pendant l'occupation. Euh, dans, dans, et se sont mariés euh, dans un camp. Ils ont Alors, Cobra, puisqu'il a fait partie de Cobra à la naissance, euh, Cobra est un mouvement euh, immédiat auprès de regroupement de, des artistes belges, danois, hollandais, français et anglais. Euh, Sonia et Ernest ont, ont intégré euh, dès le départ, euh, voilà, au début, l'esthétique du groupe était celle de... de d'un retour à l'enfance, aux origines et aux racines. Cobra is a movement just which emerges after the, the, world, the world and was gathering artists from Belgium, Holland, Denmark and France. Uh, so yeah, and uh, joined the group at the very beginning. The aesthetic of the group was to return back to childhood origins 
Oups. Religieux, oui. Pour un, un, un Africain anglais. <laughs> Sorry, for Ernest. For Ernest. African roots were the entrance gate in the movement. Ouais. He moved away quite quickly, <laughs> discreetly, contrary to Sonia, because the artists of the group were daring doing African local color. They much manipulated signs and symbols, sometimes empty. Ernest did not recognize himself. For him, all should have a holy character, quite religious, spiritual. J'ai rencontré Ernest alors que euh, j'exposais des dessins de Malevich. Il venait tous les jours à la galerie et il était discret, euh, parlait et de nouveau sympathisé. Nous avons sympathisé. Je l'invitais souvent à boire du vin rouge et euh, du. <rire> et à l'aquarelle, et c'est aussi de manière que j'ai reconnu aussi ses coteaux, euh, et c'était de, les deux artistes africains du Sud à Paris. J'ai rencontré Ernest pendant l'exhibition de Malevich Drawings. Il came each day à la galerie. Il mm. était discret, spoke, et nous became friends. I invited him often to drink red wine, Côte du Rhône, at the Bistro L'Aquarelle. This is how I met, I met him, as well as Secoto, the painter Secoto. They were two South African artists in Paris. They knew them very well, despite Secoto uh, arrived in Paris later. Mark. Alors, j'ai connu le fils de, de Ernest et de Sonia, adolescent. D'abord, il a été un peu étouffé par la personnalité de Sonia et qui avait le feu sacré et par son père qui voulait que ce soit parfait. Voilà. I knew the son of Ernest and Sonia as a teenager. He was under the pressure of Sonia's personality and his father wanted him to be absolutely perfect. He pushed him to study English to teach, but Mark was too borderline to melt in the university system. Alors, ce, ce dernier l'a poussé à faire des études d'anglais. C'est ça. Euh, et alors, le nom africain de Marc Vanga lui a été donné par Ernest, bien sûr. Sonia avait, été, avait très peur, étant donné les, la période d'apartheid et que Marc euh, veuille retourner en Afrique du Sud. Voilà. Et le... voilà. Ernest a assisté à la première expo de Marc, euh, a précisé, a organisé toute première exposition avec Poul Petersen. Donc, c'était familial, euh, euh, un artiste, euh, voilà. Euh, okay. Mark, Mark, African names, was given by Ernest. Sonia ouais. was frightened due to the apartheid period that Mark had the idea to go back to South Africa. She was worried. Ernest came to visit his first exhibition of Mark And he liked it. I have organized an exhibition with Poul Peterson, a Danish artist who was already known. He had rebuilt Malevich Architecton's models. I was 
uh, it was a double exposition for Paul and for Mark to help Mark et je n'ai jamais, jamais exposé euh, oui. Ernest parce que nous étions amis et je ne voulais pas que les, les choses se, se, se restent claires entre nous. Voilà. I, I, I have exposed Marc, but I never exposed Ernest because Ernest. we were Ni close, Sonia. close friends. <laughs> And he wanted to, that there was no interaction between friendship and, uh, and business. This is why he has never exhibited Ernest nor Sonia. Bon, That's all right. It's okay. <laughs> you can say that you were very friend, you can mention also. I can say for him that uh, they were very friendly and uh, very often they went together weekend to do picnics in the countryside or in the parks around Paris or they spent holidays together in France with friends yes. and uh, and they enjoy that friendship a lot. On a vraiment vécu avec eux. Yes, Charlie said he really lived with the Mancoba family. Exactly. That's it. Comme Clarisse aussi. Clarice. As uh, Clarice. Also. As Clarice spent so as well. Very, very well. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Elaine, everybody uh, is an architect uh, in, in Paris who was, who was friends with Manchoba and um, Charlie had a, had a gallery and exhibited Manchoba's work. Um, next up, we have Muriel Maclipe, niece of Ernest Manchoba. Uh, good day, everyone. I'm not sure if you can see us. We can hear you, but we can't see you. Okay. Um, we just switched on. And I'm, oh, wait. Oh, goodness me. Okay. Um, Without any waste of time, I'm sure uh, the video will show. Um, good day to everyone. My name is Penny Mkalipe. I'm sure you can see us now. And yes. uh, good day to everyone. And uh, we are truly honored as the Mangoba family to be part of this uh, momentous and very prestigious uh, event. And uh, the family, I must say, is very emotional as we all gather to remember the legacy of my grandfather, Ernest Mangoba. I am with my mother, please wave me. Yes, and Muriel Mkalipi, who is one of the two living nieces of my grandfather, Ernest Mangoba, and also with uh, Nomonde Mutawu, who is one of the granddaughters of Ernest Mangoba. My aunt, uh, uh, Zotwa or Muriel's, uh, has uh, hosted uh, the, uh, the many friends and uh, it's quite an honor to see everyone uh, relating their own experiences regarding how the Mangoba family touched them. And uh, I just wanted to just thank you so much, but uh, the person who has been appointed by the family to speak is my uncle Ndando uh, Mangoba, who will just give a brief uh, a, a note and also a few words of gratitude to the Constitutional Court of South Africa and uh, Ubuntu Trust and all of you for having put this prestigious event together. I will now hand over to my uncle Ndando Mangoba. Thank you. Elle 
Ntando, you might be muted because we're not hearing anything. Okay. How about now? Yes, Do we're you? hearing you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay. But let me probably carry on for the sake of time. Can I proceed now? Yes, thank you. No, all right. Uh, let me start by saying, Mural and Dombezotum Kalipi, Pumela Mangova, my sister and I, Dando Kali to Mangova, are the remaining children of that generation in the Mangova family. My great uh, 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 Mr. Mangova, Ernest, is the eldest in a family of seven siblings. Muriel Ndombizotwa is the daughter of Edith Ndondela, who was the third born in the family. My father was the last born, that is Uroni. So I'm going to represent the family in this report in honor of Ernest Mango. When Ernest and Walker came home in South Africa in the early 1990s, he was already advanced in his age. That made me think of the golden opportunity we missed out just to be able to know him better as our great uncle. There were three things we always had and knew about him. One, his intolerance of injustice that uh, were at a prime stage at that time in South Africa. Number two, his academic achievements and contribution in education as a teacher in a number of schools. And lastly, and most importantly, his artwork. Those were basically three things that we, 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 remet, we remembered about him. We never thought in our wildest dreams that we would one day meet him and his son Wonga in person. Thanks to Ezra Mite, who met him in Paris and encouraged him to come home. I personally think he went abroad never to come back again because you would remember the hostility experienced in his own country of birth. And also I think Paris offered better opportunities for him to prosper in his artwork. The arrival of Ernest and Wong rekindled the family relationship. We made a vow that we would never lose touch with one another. At that time, his two siblings, that is Edith and Dondela and Constance and John were still alive. This also made the Mangobas in South Africa to be known in Paris by his friends back there. Just to mention one, Alain Spielman and his beautiful entire family, not forgetting his friends, who else care, a daughter to Elsa Biles, who, who also invited us to visit Wonga in his sick bed in, in 2014, around August. This also made it possible for us to visit Wonga's residence, where he kept some of Sonia and Enes at work well, that wasn't a time we would have loved to visit Paris because Wong. Sadly, uh, shortly after our return from Paris, we received the devastating news of his passing. May his soul rest in peace. I must thank Alain Spielman and his family for having given us that opportunity. 
As they say, no man is an island. In any given occasion, there will always be people who exerted so much effort for its success. An event cannot be successful without people who devote their entire time and resources just to make sure everything is perfect. At the, at, at, at the, at the same time, people who attend and gather for the event are still very much a big part of its success. We are very grateful, I mean very grateful for this huge event organized by Ubuntu Trust, especially to Bridget Thompson with others who spent sleepless nights organizing this event. I thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Professor Ntuli has asked to say a few words just before we head on with the program, We're running a bit behind time, but Professor Ntuli said he, he needs to leave, so we'll just be giving over to him uh, for a short while. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I just wanted to not to leave here without, uh, from the bottom of my heart, thanking the Nglovu family as well as the Manova uh, you know, family for their presence, as well as their own words. And also what I wanted to add too, is that in our conversations with Inumangoba, uh, uh, that's where they told us that Wonga was born uh, somewhere in the basement of an artist's place of uh, uh, Giacometti, the best sculptor. Professor, we, we can't seem to hear you. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So we missed be... about the last 40 seconds of what oh. you said. Let, let me be just brief. Just wanted to say that I just wanted to thank for the bottom of my heart the presence of uh, the Mangoba family as well as the uh, Dogo family. Uh, their words are going to help us to keep uh, our art and our culture uh, uh, you know, forward. And also that in my long discussions with uh, uh, Ernest, when he visited us, when he came in here, he also told us that Wonga was born in a basement of an artist's uh, a place, uh, Alberto Giacometti, the best sculptor of the 20th uh, you know, century, the one who inspires me more than anybody else. He also was laughing so much, I could even see his back things when he told me how they got married in a concentration camp. And, uh, but in the end, uh, they married kind of secretly. It was a Nazi young official who took a photo uh, uh, and, 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 and hid it so that uh, their bosses did not know and finally offered them that photo. That humanity, uh, that little Nazi actually did, it's what when Mangova speaks about art and everything is for humanity. I thank you. Thank you, Professor, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we're honored in our offices here at the Constitutional Court today. We've got um, friends of Joseph and Lovu, Vincent Baloy, and Sukaya Charles and Kors. Um, we're, we're sharing a computer with a camera, so they'll be moving over to where I'm sitting at the moment for, for their contributions. First, I'd like to call on, on Vincent Baloy. Right here, right here. The back is Maybe we should sit on that side. Okay. Let's start with my chair.
تکلیف میکنم Hello everybody, San Bonand. My name is Vincent Baloy. I'm at the Constitutional Court today, sitting with colleagues. So I'm here by coming to present my friend, Joan Lobo. I started to know Joan. I think 1973 at Signy Kumalo's house. He was with a colleague. His name was uh, Peter Shang. So during that time, I think they were still studying at Zaten Natal Kwajlanga. So Joe and I, okay, we, we then become friends that time. And then from there, that was 1973. During that time, when he visited, uh, he was uh, uh, helping his brother. Sometimes uh, his brother was owning a taxi, which is a horse. So if we don't make art, sometimes we'll just go around helping, ranking, helping, and then my job in the text then was to collect the money when it's right. And I'll say, okay, nonke abangara koki zutela iman. And then we'll go on like that all the time. And then if, again, not making art, he will visit the old man, his father, I was uh, running a workshop of uh, Colonel Dita. Then go and help the old man. And then when we tired, and then our payment will be maybe one rent. <laughs> then we'll go back and make art. During that time, myself, uh, I joined a uh, white WCA at Dube, working under Jeanette Levine and Eric Mbata and Tumsane Mabasu. So, Artists were helping there. We were, we were working with kids there, about 10 ish up uh, 15. So it was uh, Eric Bata and Ben Matala. And some artists would visit, uh, like Kumalo and Dennis Matsusa. At, 1973, uh, they apply for us, uh, myself and Tumsali, to Rock Thrift and joined the uh, art school there. I started studying there and then till 1976. And then I was at my own by that time, working as an artist. So I start. Uh, well, while I was at my own was running a studio at Salvation Army, all of the artists would visit me. And then because of the situation, we didn't last, I didn't last then, and starting to work at the factories till 1986. Uh, I start work. 1986, yeah. And then I forget to <laughs> introduce Charles because Charles was one one one, one of us at Rockshoot. Then we then meet with Charles at uh, 
Fundacent in 1986. 1989, I think I left uh, Funda. In 1990, that's when I started uh, to work at the that's university. Till uh, uh, 19, uh, 2019, yes, that's when I uh, uh, pension. So thank you for everything. That's myself, Vincent Anna. Uh. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I think I'm deeply honored to come and talk on the event that encompasses the livelihood, the creative maturity of a friend, a great friend of mine. So I think it's one of those moments where we've got to look back in time and see the attributes that have made this great man uh, a part of us today. And yet in retrospect, he, he lives, but not in flesh now. We are breathing his spiritual well-being, and we are saying, uh, let us be all together in prayer that commemorates the spiritual nucleus that has made the Lugu family conjoined, it, conjoined with the spirit of the Manoa family because these two great guys have made this day a very, very visually realizable uh, punctuation in the wheel of time. We are very, very happy to say Joe defied the essence of the, the, the wrongly spelled essence of uh, mortality. Mortality as a word lives uh, and immortality on the flip side of the coin says there's nothing like death because in Zulu we always say uh, the players will say, man will pass on, but the players will commemorate his very existence by saying, in Zizwa, I harm the Ishi Mong, which means all the things that make men would tick would be the things that say, you are not with us, but yet you are with us. You are with us. So, Coming back also to some of the very, very important things that you told us, taught us in his borrowed time with us as ethereal beings was that uh, in Zulu they say, Hamba, <coughs> which simply means that go yonder, my child. You will meet not your 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 your, your, your brothers as in your mother and sister, but you will meet other people who will be important in your life. Friend. So, which means that's how we came to know each other at Rock Street. And we were just a small family of about twelve or fourteen, but that legacy hasn't passed on. Because it means once in Africa, when you greet somebody, you say, you don't say, uh, 
uh, hi Pell, good morning. You will say uh, San Bonan. San Bonan is merely saying meaning that you become a representative of the other members of the family that are not there. So Umas Tangana Arab Strip, we met from the, the different parts of South Africa and we learned to say home is not home because of the, the physical, uh, physically uh, confined space that makes you at times when you're and you feel like you're prisoners because it's a foreign school and it's all that, but you work like you are a man possessed who would burn the midnight oil and then make artwork at night and also attend school and do all those things. But also we enjoyed music a great deal. And Joe took the throne when it came to dancing. <laughs> he was a, a flexible mover. You know, moving as if he was dancing on a, an oily floor. And, but when it came to our subjects, the, the causes that we took there, we, we, we highly held him in high esteem because of the skills he introduced in trying to beat a, 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 a learning area that you were just about to think it, you are failing to understand it. But Joe, out of the 12 students that were there, Joe became the best weaver. And it must also be mentioned that there were people there who were uh, notable mentors like Umam Ali Nandavele, who had been to Sweden uh, for Ufunda uh, Iwivin, and a place where Ulokuzana Ujo got all this was from Umam Ali who together with Little more. Johnson, who taught us design in textile design. And um, all those things are worth mentioning. And also the fact that one of the people who is very important in this regard is uh, um, uh, the, 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 the people who Joe had to teach even because the, the institution had noticed that he had uh, very, very formidable skills in building up a, people that were usually regarded as illiterate, coming from Mzinyati, out there in the Bundus and all that. Because an area like that, it, I am reminded of the fact that there was a certain professor who came to Rock Street to, 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 to talk about Umam Dynam Leaf, who had won the national competition in ceramics, and but she had never been to school of ceramics. And she was a lecturer at the University of Cape Town, I think, just forgotten his na her name. But look at that that uh, entwined or interwoven with the African indigenous knowledge systems that says uh, some of the most critically important things in life are those that you open your eyes to and the journey never opens, it never ends. And once a baby is born, even though the baby passes away, but the, the focus on the world yonder makes the baby uh, to be astute with wonder as to say, where am I going? How do I communicate with these strange individuals that call themselves my family? 
But when she's hungry or whenever she, he or she he needs food, he'll make a mark. That mark becomes so vitally important that the baby is able to abstractly convey the need that reigns inside of him or her and the baby cries and every person jumps to the rescue. So the tapestry that we see here is the tapestry that says, uh, it's Joe Jovu and Ernest Manova's second coming. Because here's a time, the timeline that says Manova was born in 1904 and Joe in 1953, but the spiritual bridge of communication makes us realize that these people were contemporaries, no matter whether one was born in 1904 and the other in 1953, because it means the abstract nature of the interwoven patterns that life presents to us makes us wonder, what is it that makes the world a nice place to live in. Besides the 1976 riots, but we've got a redeemer in the ancestor. The ancestor says, forget where you come from. Uh, go back, make a visitation to antiquity, and you'll be reminded that you are not dead. Because the, the death of, a, of a, a living thing can be best realized when the spirit force completely becomes null and void. But now make sure that you understand that life goes on and the abstract interpretation of the ancestor is that your ancestors are still alive. Manova is one of them. And there will be other kids who are born today and tomorrow who will imbibe from the fountain of inspiration given to us as a gift from the first that be through John Jovu and as Manova. And you know, you can write volumes about this man. And you know, most of our better or make a metaphorical interpretation of what Manova means. Yes, Josie, so to Manova. Manova, Manova, a victor. So, which means it's a, a, a surname that makes us proud that two of our major influences in the weaving, contemporary weaving as seen today, makes us realize that no. Me and Angelo Wang is an Indian title. Now it's thing here, now it's in this. It's a good move that you want to anticipate uh, doing by uh, making the world know that you are aware that uh, your father belonged to this family and titles Stella, who compiled a sketchbook colored one because you have been to a, a, a UCT and you met our prodigious product there at, 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 at UCT, who was the Latin title. And Phil sketch do in memory of the very fact that we are on a time top. The time top that says, keep the top spinning because it will keep reminding you of your father. And we are saying, thank you, mother and your father for having brought you along. And thank you, continue making those sweet, colorful beadworks, uh, which are more like ornaments today that will tell tales about the creative, uh, imbibing that your 
you, you suckled from your father. So it, it, it means Usindi Swangala can curate and write volumes and volumes that enthuse on love and all the nuances that make death a, a defiable thing. Because we can defy death by saying, Mundu will live on together because long after that person is dead, and then Shiaians and Sabians in, in, in Africa that bring the memories back. So, my children, Stella, Nita Terashalento, Sin Bongi Lenguchi, you so loved your father in such a way that. Uh, Siabono Ujo was well loved in the family. And they have tapestry at the ancestor. Okokola, Okoko Betabati, Pantabam, get to an essay. Arahambang, we sit telling and we are booya food. My booya, we are celebrate when Zim Seven wins why on the loan to Picos Umundaga. Uh, we have proved that death exists in one form. This is Vivanis Hamba Pizwaso. In Kombanze, is Vimba, is Vivan or TPS. A Kombis Uti. Mind the room I told you, you booze, booze and then an instant with Hanjo Hanja. So I told him the Lababa Pambi. So Sitella de Uti. See song a lingulum with his bungile. Would you see part of this event? Mother, in says I cried on a sink. Ucho was a crater. Ucho was a tenor as old Tisha went. The rocks reversed and cut it a good note. Don't give up, guys. Living is such a good thing. And Ujo. Also, must study it again here tonight. Lapa Ujo felt to go to Nadi swallowed by the miseries of the township. Kavan, you know, it's difficult to survive with the Nadi. I teach Hadi so kind and so seven the open school so that we twins are here from our Fadana and we make we made a, a very meaningful contribution. Ujo became a supremo as an administrator because he wove the network, the creative networking in Devon that brought children who were frustrated by matrix studies, who wanted to learn to dance, who wanted to learn vision uh, art, and who wanted to practice their craft as seen in the Malo poets who were uh, given space to work in Delhi. So Joe gave them a home, who Joe made it possible for these guys to get tutors who volunteered services like Abo Jainai Du, Abo Penuel Maduna, and also theatricians, Abo Ketanda Kani, Abo uh, Don Joseph, and all those guys. So, we are saying that Ujo superseded the mark that most people could have done. And Ujo made it possible that it was a desert in which culture, culture could not thrive. You would be talking to Alisbeck all the time, and Clayton all the time. So Joe made it possible for Devon to have its own or as it's where young people drank. And most of them, like Zule Kuntieto, who got admitted as a student at the UCT, and who made a big name for himself. And Sipom Danda, who is one of the highly regarded scribes, uh, curators and you name it. And he also went well with the open school way where Joe was administrator. And uh, Casey Governor, a well-known 
be a Christian in Ketanda County. And Devon became alive with wonder. So, Joe, may I sit right about I sit in the Sbonga Uguti, Dom Sevenzi, and I could boom at your human. Some kind of a, a modest publication, as well, you would know. What were the people missing? Into as of Patera and I say, Golden Uber Corner, a book that becomes an attestation of the fact that once upon a time there lived amongst other people two great men, Ubab Manov and Ubab Joe. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're running behind schedule, so I think I want to give over to the chair of the Arts and Ubuntu Trust, Zubaira Jaffa, and then following that, if, if there's people that need to leave, you're welcome to, but those that still have time to stay, we can enter into discussion with who's still in the room. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Brad Charles. Uh, you've said everything that I could possibly have wanted to say. You were so eloquent. Uh, I'm not going to repeat a lot of that, just to say on behalf of the arts and Ubuntu Trust, we, this was a magnificent morning. Thank you to the Constitutional Court and your whole team. All your names are listed in the catalog that Bridget has so kindly put together and all the names of the uh, people who have been involved in every step of the way is listed. Um, I just noticed that the family members are not listed in detail and so I just want to say um, to follow on with what Brad Charles said that I want you to be assured um, Tato, Tando, Muriel, Sindiswa, all of you uh, who appeared, I haven't mentioned all your names, to say that we, there are many of us who are committed to upholding your father's legacy, your father's legacies. And we, Arts Ubuntu Trust was started in 2005 largely the brainchild of Bridget Thompson, but of course we are a team. And um, this is a very, very special moment um, to see on display the greatness of the talent that we have in this country and to affirm the fact and in Ernest's words that my people are the people of the whole world. Very, very, it was a central message. I was fortunate to meet him in 1994. I was fortunate to take him and Wonga around uh, a trip around the peninsula and spend time with them. And uh, I will never ever forget that encounter. And uh, uh, as a result of Governor Becky's uh, introductions. And so we are a rich country in spirit in humanity we are going through a very difficult time at the moment but i uh, we must be urged not to to we must remember not to give up and squander the legacy of all these great people um i also want to say thank you very much to our friends in paris and uh, for for making the effort um, uh, despite the language barrier uh, to Elaine and Charlie for participating and to all of you. As I said, I can't mention all the names, but thank you, thank you so much. And unfortunately, I have to leave now, but I wish you all well for the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if there's anybody with a question for anybody else, um, now would be the time, and, but we will excuse anybody who, who needs to leave at this point. Thank you for everybody for joining. Um, Bridget did mention that we will circulate 
the, the, the publication that Art and Ubuntu Trust is, is currently finalizing and we'll send it to all the, the participants who registered for today's discussion. Thank you. I need a clap, guys. I need a clap mm -hmm. <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Any questions, any remarks? Mom Bongitlomo has her hand up. Yes, Mabongi, you're muted. You're still muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I was just saying thank you to everyone. I, I left for a, a short while. I wanted to just, uh, is everyone still on? No, everyone is gone. There's still 27 of us left. Mm. Oh, okay. I wanted to, to just commend my fellow rock strippers, uh, Charles and, uh, and, and Vincent, who, we, who were my four bears at uh, Rock Strip. And to just say that um, I think the existent, existence of Rock Strip as an institution is fully represented in so many uh, of our national uh, art collection institutions, as well as in uh, uh, at, at the Constitutional Court and all over in the world. That even though Rock Strip had a, a very short life, of, uh, from 1962 to 1982, but as Charles was saying, it lives on. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, CCAC. <laughs> Anybody else? Salelo? Salelo, I, your I, yes, yeah, no, no, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Work, uh, as an employee of the US uh, Embassy and as having given a grant to the preservation and conservation of the artwork, after going through this program, I'm very honored that we are actually able to bring out the, 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 the importance of preservation and conservation of this artwork. So I'm just saying that uh, as the embassy, we are very pleased to be part of this program because in as much as we have the artworks with time and everything, they depreciate in terms of the lighting, humidity and everything else. I'm very happy that as the embassy, we were able to give a grant to the Constitutional Art uh, Trust to preserve this wonderful work so that future generations can be able to appreciate. So that's what I just wanted to mention in this. Thank you, Francois. Thank you, Savalon. Thank you for the support. <laughs> Anybody else? Speak now or for, forever hold your peace. <laughs> if that's it, I think we can, we can wrap it up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you to everybody from the Arts and Ubuntu Trust. And um, yeah, thank you. Beautiful moment. Thank you, Francois, and everybody at the Constitutional Court Trust and all the participants. It's really been very moving and wonderful um, to feel we're part of this relay race. Um, not relay, not race, but part of this relay of, of um, handing things on from generation to generation. It's really been beautiful. Thank you, all of you. <laughs>